I guess the first question that would come to anybody's minds is that why do we have persistent conflict when it is so patently and obviously an inefficient outcome? Everybody would first think of economic inequality as the main cause of social conflict. The puzzling thing is that in fact so far it has been impossible to find solid empirical evidence showing this link. If we observe uh, uh, the various conflicts that in, in the past 50 years, then many of them appear to be ethnic in nature. Do we have a serious statistical handle on that? Can we actually show using theoretical and econometric methods that ethnic divisions actually cause conflict. And shall we adopt a primordialist interpretation that is that uh, the differences between ethnic groups generate hatreds or resentment and this is going to lead to conflict? Or shall we view ethnicity as an instrument to achieve other political or economic goals? The level of conflict can be explained just by the sum of two weighted measures of ethnic diversity. One is the measure of fractionalization, the other is the measure of social polarization, ethnic polarization. Fractionalization is an index of diversity and it has a very simple interpretation. You take two people from a society and this index gives you the probability that these two people belong to two different groups. Therefore, the larger the number of groups, the higher the value of this measure. Polarization, on the other hand, is a more complex measure. It is designed to capture the degree of intergroup antagonism in a society. And this is driven by two factors. One is the degree of alienation between people belonging to two different groups. And the other is the degree of identification between the members of the same ethnic group. If uh, it turns out that the payoff is essentially public, is new laws that are going to be implemented, change of constitution, new individual freedoms, then who is going to rule? does matter a lot, because if I feel that the group that is going to rule is a group that is not that far from me, then I won't be that upset if this group conquers power. But if I feel that this group is going to implement a policy that I just hate, then I will feel very offended by this group taking power, and therefore I will fight harder. So that means that to explain conflict in that case, what are the intergroup distances? And the motivation, uh, the group commitment of members is very important. That's why then polarization is very important to explain conflict. Whereas the, the, in the private case, if there's a large group, a given amount of loot has to go around over a larger number of people, and therefore the per capita enjoyment of the, of the prize dissipates with the number of people. So in a public goods conflict, large groups actually have more of an incentive to put in resources. In a private goods conflict, small groups have more of an incentive to put in resources, simply because the dissipation is less. So that's what the theory does. The theory gives us very clear prediction that polarization should work through the public component of conflict and fractionization through the private component. That's what we take to the table. This result is interesting because it supports an instrumentalist view of ethnicity, right? So the ethnic variables are significantly related to conflict as long as there are political or economic prices at stake. And therefore I think that this we learn uh, something important. First, the use of theory that dispels the initial idea that in fact just pure ethnic polarization, pure ethnic fractionalization was significant. This could have driven us to believe that ethnicity per se uh, was a factor that would drive conflict. Uh, but then thanks to the model, then we have tested that in fact this is not the case. Is that if they play a role is because they are joined with combining with uh, private benefits or public benefits. And I think those are really the main, the main results of the paper. Now to think about that, we have to think about how conflict resources are generated. Presumably they're generated by a mixture of bodies and money. Okay, you need money for the conflict, you need bodies for the conflict. Now what's interesting about money and bodies is that the richer a society becomes, the easier it is to supply money. But the richer society becomes, the harder it is to supply bodies. 
Okay? Because bodies have other things to do in a richer society, right? What if we had both these worlds? How, how can we have both these worlds? The answer is, you can have both these worlds if a group is very unequal. Because then, within a group, there will be rich people who are ready to supply the money and poor, unemployed, young men, typically, right, who would be only too willing to supply the labor. So the hypothesis that Laura and Joan and I are currently working with is that the, one of the important ways in which economics enters the conflict process is within group inequality. If there is a lot of within group inequality, then there's this perfect synthesis of money and bodies, which might make for a more conflictual outcome.